So we have a publication called Risk Management Monthly, and we've been doing it um, for 12 years, actually. Uh, Greg Henry, some of you know of Dr. Henry. Uh, he was the uh, president of two malpractice insurance companies. He's reviewed over 2,000 cases. So he's the uh, Johnny Carson, and I'm the Ed McMahon. Some of you probably don't know either of those. Um, and we, we review the uh, literature and cases, and we interview lawyers and the like. And so I went through uh, each month what, what was one of the pearls from that month. The first one was in November of 2018, where there was a case where uh, somebody came into the emergency department a, a, and uh, asked for a refill of their uh, psychiatric medications. And the patient was taking a really hefty doses. And the physician said, I really don't feel comfortable prescribing that much, uh, even though you've been on that for a while. I don't, that's, that's outside of my, my comfort zone. I have, it's not in the book, you know, et cetera. And so the physician prescribed a more traditional dose. Patient went home, became psychotic, and uh, was brought back into the emergency department. Uh, he was suicidal as well, was hospitalized and hung himself. What did that cost? One million dollars. And the issue was, why did not, the patient was stabilized on this level of antipsychotics, that there's a large, large variability in what uh, those doses can be, and the physician did not call the patient's psychiatrist, did not call the psychiatrist on call to get a little counsel, and basically underdosed this person who was stable, and ultimately a series of bad things happened, and it cost a million dollars. And actually, I'm surprised that it was only a million dollars. Um, but that, so that basically says if you're prescribing medication uh, for somebody and you're not really comfortable with what the doses are, get some help so that you can have somebody, you know, standing by your side here, because this is a, a nasty problem. In that same issue, they talked about suicidal or potentially suicidal patients. And I think one of the things that we often get is a consult from the um, local suicide assessment team or whatever you call them where you are, and they come in and they kind of assess what, are the, what the suicidality of what, and, uh, this person, where their disposition maybe ought to be, and they give you advice. The advice that they give you is just that. It's a consult. When we get a consult, we basically can choose to listen or choose not to listen. Sometimes, uh, ultimately, you are responsible. So if you don't feel comfortable with their advice, uh, it's your call. It's your call in terms of uh, whether you want to keep them or not because um, consults are just that. However, obviously, if they give a consult that says this patient should be admitted, that's going to be something that's on the easy side to do. Automated speech recognition. You wouldn't think that would be involved in lawsuits, but actually, there's a study there of 51,800 closed claims. 51,800 closed claims. They found nine cases in which automated speech recognition may have been an element in the suit. In no case was the technology the direct cause of harm, and in the majority of cases, the error would not have changed the meaning of the clinical document. Nine out of 51,800. And ultimately, it didn't seem to matter that much. The authors of this study conclude you should read all dictation, but the facts did not support that conclusion. The facts say don't bother reading your dictations. Nine out of 51,800. And um, tomorrow, Kevin will be here, Kevin Clower. Kevin is a lawyer, doctor, and his advice is do not read your dictations. The, the math says don't read your dictations. There's nothing substantial. It's not going to say they broke the right arm when, we, when they broke their left arm. Um, and this goes against everything I think that we've been taught. You've got to read them if you're going to sign it kind of thing. But Kevin will give you the rationale for why not to do that, because it's a waste of time. You've got so many other things to do. Consent for TPA and strokes, we already talked about that. Um, that's a no-brainer. Asymptomatic hypertension. So a person comes in and their blood pressure is high, and uh, they went to uh, the CVS and they took it because they had nothing better to do while they were waiting 
or they just felt to check it. And it comes back high, and they come into the emergency room because uh, some family members said, you better get that checked out kind of thing. And uh, it is high. And what are you going to do about it? Well, this whole, this whole issue about um, maybe I'll wait a little, wait a, wait a while, and it'll go down. Uh, I waited a while, and it didn't go down. It's still, uh, you know, 180 over 110. Do they have a doctor? No, not really. There's not going to be anybody to see them in the next couple of days. And so what is your, your choice? One of them is to, and I think that nobody does this anymore, is give subliminal nifedipine. That, that, that's out. You know, that's, that's called, you know, commando lowering their blood pressure. They have a syncopal attack. They have a, a stroke. And uh, that, that's, there's just been so many cases about that. That's like 1970s. But there is this issue about Persistent, you know, 180, 110. They really don't have a doctor. You call up and the on-call doctor says, okay, I'll see him. Uh, I'll have him send, come over and I'll see him on, uh, on Monday. And it would be appropriate then to give them something for their blood pressure in the emergency department or not. And this is not a medical legal kind of thing because what we're going to give is something that is routinely given for high blood pressure. You've measured it several times. It has not gone down. It was high at the CVS. So it's, going to, it's persistently high. And uh, it's a number that makes you feel uncomfortable. So you could give them, per, you know, you could give them a um, diuretic. Everybody who's, uh, who's got hypertension on diuretic, you can give them some, you know, like a, uh, any of the other routine medicines. Everybody who has hypertension is basically on two medicine at least, um, and that could be done. And then they could go to this person, this doctor, going to see him a couple of days ago, it's likely to have come down, and they can reassess at that time whether to uh, persist, change, or, that, or the like. The only issue there is when they come to the emergency department and they want their blood pressure and they're concerned about their blood pressure, you're going to have to do something, uh, either not, not, we're not going to treat you, we may treat you. I'm going to get you follow-up. Those kinds of things are all going to be important because there have been the cases of people who have gone to the emergency room with high blood pressure, <clears throat> nothing was done, they go home and they stroke. And it doesn't look good. If they were the blood, uh, they were there. And there was a study done a long, long, long time ago where they looked at vital signs of people in the emergency department. Uh, and they found that people who had elevated blood pressure, which was above 140 over 90, they were rarely told that they had elevated blood pressure. It was rarely repeated in the chart. And when you think about it, um, you know, it's 150 over 90 and nobody repeated it. And the higher it was, the more likely it was that they would not be told anything about their blood pressure. So there are the lawsuits then that where the patient comes uh, to a hospital with edema and uh, it's now five years later, and they're in renal failure. And uh, they say, well, did you ever have your blood pressure checked? Uh, let me think. Oh, you know, I did go to the emergency department uh, for my sprained ankle, and they checked my blood pressure, and they said, you know, uh, not much about it. And they go back and pull that record, and it was 160 over 110. And nothing happened. They didn't get follow-up. It, you know, it was not noted that in, the, in the record. And it's like, write the check kind of thing. Delegation of consent. Um, Supreme Court in the state of Pennsylvania set a precedent recently where they said every consent that you get has to be uh, gotten by the person who's going to do the procedure. You couldn't delegate it to anybody. Um, now, that's not because it was in Pennsylvania. It doesn't mean that's the... Uh, but they, they had a reasonable rationale about not de delegating it to nurses or other people when you're going to do some kind of a procedure. Here's one. This kind of sounds like it's pretty straightforward. It's an, uh, a re retired person, lady, comes into the emergency department with an um, injury to her lower, one of her lower extremities. Upon leaving uh, or being discharged, she said, would you give me a, um, a escort home? I said, are you serious? So, no. Well, can you give me a wheelchair so I can get out of the, um, out of the department and uh, get, get a cab? 
And uh, they said no. They, they would not do that, which is, you know. She gets out and gets into a cab, and on, on the way home, basically, gets out of the cab with, with her crutches that they gave her, and she falls and injures herself getting out of the cab. She had been given morphine in the emergency department for the pain in her uh, injured extremity. And uh, how much did that cost? $850,000. So the issues are, it seems like they're pretty straightforward. Crutch walking. Is able, somebody able to walk with crutches adequately? Has a nurse documented they can use crutches appropriately? If they're not able to use crutches appropriately and they're in their wheelchair, do they have steps at home? Is there somebody to take care of them? All of those things are, have to be in the decision about what is going to be the disposition. Is there a relative we can call for you? You know, can you stay over their place overnight kind of thing? These guys were, seem to be not very caring for this lady, $850,000. There was a thing about being a team physician for college football teams and, and, and higher up. It basically says, probably not a good idea to be a team physician for a, a college or, or pro team because you're really acting on behalf of the club rather than the players and that the real relationship is between you and the players and the health of the players. Physicians, team physicians have been sued because they've masked injuries by injecting lidocaine into painful areas, negligently clearing them to go back into play, and not advising players of the potential consequences of their injury, particularly as it relates to knee injuries. All three of those have resulted in suits against the team physician. Um, in June of this past year, where there was an, some issues regarding concern about training of PAs and NPs to work in the emergency department, um, and there, the issues of, of supervision. The, uh, there's 23 states now where nurse NPs have autonomous practice rights, and the, the, uh, there's, that move is really very um, aggressively being pursued. PAs want to do something similar. Um, but in the emergency department setting, it is the hospital that, who, that employs you, or the ER group that employs you, ultimately sets the supervision standards, independent of the ability to work autonomously um, supervision standards are set by hospital or ER group if you're working there. Co-signing charts. Do you co-sign any PA and P charts? You do that? Come on, some of you do that. And, and, and the question is, why do you sign NP charts, PA charts? That's a secret. That's a secret. Nobody knows why. Oh, no, that's just it. That's where, that's where we're going here. If you sign charts of a PA or NP, as if you're a physician, if you, and if you've not seen the patient, physically seen the patient, concurred on the, the uh, treatment of that patient, examined that patient, even from the doorway, you can't bill uh, uh, 100%. So I wonder why signing charts at the end of the shift is done. Is it a quality assurance endeavor? Well, quality assurance thing should not be on the same chart as the patient's official medical record. If you're going to do quality assurance, you, you know, you, you, you go to the quality assurance department, they give you, here's a form to fill out, uh, you, know, where the, you know, that's not a part of the medical record. That goes into quality assurance. So what does your name on mean on the bottom of that chart? You shouldn't be shining, you should not be signing those charts because it doesn't, it implies some kind of relationship that wasn't there. You never saw that patient. Why should you be signing that chart? And God forbid whoever you're working with is, is saying, well, that means I can charge 100% uh, to Medicare. Because one of the nurses in the department ought to be a whistleblower on her and the, on you, and they will retire because, on your group. And I often wonder, why do doctors sign those charts? They, they, they're signing the stack at the end of the shift. What does that mean? There's a couple of, uh, there's a good paper in here about USACs. You know the U.S. Acute Care Solutions, that group uh, that, uh, they get a bunch of contracts around the country, they're advertising all the time. 
Well, they had a really good risk management program, and I knew that, you know, MD JD who, who ran that, and they, they looked at almost 10 million of their cases, 1,029 emergency physicians and 87 emergency departments, and it's really pretty remarkable. Over that 9,477,000 cases, they had 98 malpractice suits. That's one per 100,000 cases. It had been previously believed that the number of law lawsuits was in the neighborhood of 1 to 30, 1 to 40,000 in that neighborhood. But the fact is that lawsuits have dropped precipitously, and this group had a good risk management program. 1 in 100,000. Of those uh, 98 uh, cases, 19 of them resulted in money changing hands. Whether they were settled, 20% of them were settled, 70% were dismissed, plaintiff verdict in 2%. Plaintiff verdict in 2%. By the, these cases really often just don't get, get to trial. They had the defense verdict in four. So out of all those cases, there was like six of them that went to trial. That was really pretty impressive uh, record. Does uh, DNR, um, this is a case about the DNR tattoo. You read about that case? Guy comes in and he's got a DNR tattoo he's, and he uh, needs to be resuscitated. The question is, is that a valid? Um, and the answer is no. Because DNRs basically require the ability to change them. Uh, being, uh, and because we all know situations where DNRs basically change their mind at the uh, and without the ability to change it, it's not a valid DNR. Also, just for technical purposes, uh, valid DNRs need to be witnessed. Well, I guess the guy who put the t tattoo on witnessed it. And they need to be notarized. So you have to have a notary tattoo uh, as well, well as the do not, you have the notary tattoo. Um, nurses with a doctorate, DNPs, um, some states are saying you can't call yourself doctor in the setting of the emergency department, because it would be confusing. Um, the doctor's company, which is the largest malpractice insurance company owned by physicians, looked at 332 closed claims for emergency medicine between 2007 and 2013. What were they? At the top of the list, now in the old days at the top of the list, it was missed MI, missed MI, missed MI. For decades it was missed MI. No, no longer. Acute cerebral vascular accident is number one. And what are those suits really about? Failure to offer thrombolytic therapy. Not failure to give it, failure to offer it. Um, and doctors will lose most of those suits because you have taken away the option from that patient of choosing yes or no regarding the therapy to the extent that they're able to. So you gotta, you got to offer it. Even if you, you know, the question is ethically, I don't believe in it. Do I have to do something I ethically don't believe in? Well, I think, I think in this case, you probably do because it's really the patient's, this is about shared decision making. You can give them the data. The data is, and the, and the NINDS trial, 12% got better and 6% got worse. And of the 6% got worse, about a third of them died. Um, that's not too complicated. It, it's almost like a flip of a coin. And the vast majority of patients, 12% got better, 6% got worse, that's 18. The vast majority get no benefit whatsoever. So uh, that was number one. Number two is myocardial infarctions. Number three, spinal epidural abscess. Spinal epidural abscess, which is the, this rare kind of thing, but you will lose that case. You will lose that case. And they'll come in in a wheelchair, and there's all of this, you know, in terms of malpractice, it's much better to kill them than to maim them. Because a maim them means that you're going to have to be alive for the next 30 years having full-time nurses around the clock. So, and all the groups that I know that uh, have risk management in initiatives keep getting burned over this diagnosis. This needs to get cranked up in terms of my thinking about spinal epidural abscesses.
pulmonary embolism was four, necrotizing fasciitis, those are the bad things, pain out of proportion, you know. I probably lifted something at, in a, while I was in the garage, my shoulder hurts, you know, kind of thing. No real history of trauma. Patients have this desire to establish causality. Well, my back hurts, you know, I was working in the yard, I, that was probably it. You know, they, and they want to mislead you and lead you down the garden path with um, things that are not exactly... The, um, meningitis still, meningitis, the very, very young and the very old, you know, still, not much. A uh, good friend of mine, his ER doc, has a um, granddaughter, she's three, and she had pneumococcal meningitis. All her shots, s substantial neurodeficit when she re recovered. So, so these things are not 100%. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, bad. Septicemia, you know, there's a big thing about following all the rules on septicemia. Torsion of the testes, I have no idea why anybody would get paid any money for torsion of the testes, but it's on the list. Um, where's the damages? Don't you have to have damages when you have a lawsuit? You know, there's got to be damages. What's the damages? You're, you lost the testes. Uh, is it, you can't get somebody pregnant? Well, we'll pay you the money after you can't get them pregnant. How about we just wait a couple of decades? Uh, and um, is there some kind of cosmetic kind of thing you're concerned about? You only have one testes? Well, we can put a chicken egg in there, and you'd have the biggest testes in the world, you know. You know so where's the damage? But hey, that's on the list. Time is testicle. Um, all of the problems in emergency medicine relate to diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. We are in the diagnosis business. And 57% uh, in this large series of 300 some cases, wrong, failure to make the diagnosis in a timely manner, wrong diagnosis, delayed diagnosis, improper management is 13%, 5% centered on improper treatment or performance of a procedure. So it's diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis. There's more detail about that. Caps on awards for pain and suffering have basically cut the legs out of malpractice uh, cases uh, wherever these places have uh, put these caps in. California has had a cap of $250,000 pain and suffering for at least 20 years. People say, well, geez, 20 years ago, you could, buy a, you could buy a house in California 20, for $250,000. Now you can buy a car in California for $250,000. It's like it never kept up with inflation over the years. And people said, come on, that, let's be fair here. And because there's a cap on pain and suffering, there's a, a, a bunch of cases where people had genuine, were genuinely harmed by the medical system, but lawyers just don't want to take the case because there's no money in them because the cap is $250,000. Confidentiality. So the, all the hospitals now have zero tolerance systems in place. You screw up and you look at somebody's record in, inappropriately, um, you're out. Some hospitals have paid serious, serious fines. Johns Hopkins Health System agreed to pay $190 million settlement for breaches of 7,000 people's records, but over at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, the Hospital of Stars, people are always looking at, you know, Kim Kardashian's uh, pulling up her record kind of thing, and there was a, it was rampant over there, and they basically s established a zero tolerance policy year out kind of thing. What about things like um, a patient wants to record you? You know, they want to um, take a picture of you doing a laceration or suturing like that, and you, or whatever it is, and you don't feel comfortable. You don't want them to do that. What are your options if that occurs? Um, 39 states allow one party to consent in a picture between two people or a phone call between two people. So you hear on the phone, this call may be monitored for you know, quality purposes. They don't have to get your permission to record the call in 39 states. Uh, in some states, you do need the permission of, the, of both parties, but they're in the minority. 
California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, Michigan, Massachusetts, Montana, New Hampshire, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Washington. They can't take your picture. They can't record you unless you agree to it. So they come into the emergency department, and they, they want to record this thing. And uh, your obligation is to do a, a medical screening examination to determine whether there is an emergency present. If you determine there is no emergency, then you can say, uh, my obligation to you is, is over. Now, obviously, that's not going to be very good for PR, but the, uh, once you've determined there's no medical emergency, you're not required to do anything further on those, on those people. And you can say, you know, I've asked you not to do that. I don't want to be recorded. I don't need to, uh, I no, no longer need to, to uh, care for you. Has anybody dealt with the recording issue here? Look, everybody, you know, a lot of people. Well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get to, uh, there, there is, there, you know, there's always this surreptitious recording, and surreptitious recording basically kind of like, if you're in one of the states that doesn't re, uh, require your consent, they can surreptitiously record. They can't re surreptitiously record in California and use that as any kind of evidence because you haven't consented to that. I do think the way to deal with this, though, is to have a nice big sign that says, that basically says, for the privacy of our patients, no photography or audio video recording are, are permitted in the emergency department. So you basically make it, it's, it's about you. We're gonna, it's for your privacy that we're doing this. So that doesn't come across as being hard-assed about it. Communication and resolutions. Most hospitals now have a full, uh, full disclosure policy if they make a mistake. Uh, American Hospital Association says you ought to do that, and I think most hospitals do do that. So if a mistake is made, somebody gets to basically um, deal with it. Your lawyer, however, is not interested in you admitting anything or talking to anybody about anything because the legal system is very adversarial in terms of, uh, and it's about discovery and those kinds of things, and you're not supposed to talk to anybody except your spouse about this, or you're not supposed to talk to them about, unless it's a, some kind of quality control meeting or that, uh, that you're in. But the hospital basically has full disclosure, and you basically are not so interested in full disclosure. So the bottom line in this, these things is you have to get a hold of your, your attorney, whoever's going to be assigned to you, pronto, quicko. There is this thing about, called apology laws. Uh, 36 states have apology laws, which says that if you say you're sorry, you, know, you give some kind of apology to a person, that that is not able to be used against you in any kind of court of law, an apology. But an apology is not an acknowledgement of guilt. Most of those laws say, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong medicine. That, you just crossed the line. You're not allowed to acknowledge that you are the cause of the problem, that, you, um, that you're accepting res responsibility. And I know it's often it would be very difficult to separate the two, you know? But the apology laws in your state may or may not include the, uh, I'm sorry, it was my fault. So it's okay, it's I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, it's not okay to uh, my fault. Um, I only have two left. Um, there's, we see some really big dollar cases for failure to report child abuse. In cases that it was really kind of, should, should have been suspected. If you had read the nurse's notes, there was one case came in, a little baby came in, there was a concern about blood in the mouth. The doctor looked and really didn't really see much, and they kind of just blew it off. Um, and, you know, they send the babies home. They all come back with, you know, more, more severe injuries, skull fractures, and those kinds of things. And when you do that, basically you have broken the law in the state in which you work because you did not report suspected child abuse. And you will be then sued by those parents uh, because of the harm that was caused to their child by them after they get out of jail. And lastly, 
I doubt that any of you do this, but I think that it's, I think it's kind of important. It's called acknowledging departmental policies. Acknowledging departmental policies. So you have a new doctor, new PA, new NP coming to work in your department. Your department has a certain number of critical policies that you, they must know that you are doing. And, and one of them is, as an example, this state requires that you report um, disorders characterized by lapse of consciousness. In the case of California, if you have a disorder characterized by lapse of consciousness, you had a seizure, you had a fainting spell, you had a, a heart block that caused this fainting spell, that has to be reported to the Department of Motor Vehicles. And if it is not reported, then you broke that law. And if then if that, as a result of you not reporting it, in addition, this person who had the seizure is driving a car and hits a school bus, then the lawsuit is against you and your insurance doesn't cover it because you have broken the law. Your insurance can't cover you from breaking a law. There was a great case in San Diego where a psychiatrist or, or neurologist, either one, the per, about a person who had a seizure, and basically allowed them to clear them to drive the, uh, their car. Big accident. The, gar the wages of that neurologist were, were garnished to pay for all of the, the loss. Mount Parkinson Insurance Company, not interested in talking to you. So I do think that there's a list of maybe eight or ten really key policies that every soul coming into the department needs to be aware of and that they need to sign off that I've read these policies. You don't want any new people to say, I didn't know. I didn't know. Especially when it's a big deal policy, of which, when you think about it, there's going to be a bunch of them. Not all of them, you know, but there may be eight or ten. 